I'd like to thank the, this fine, fine organization for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Uh, this is something that uh, is very, very important to me, and obviously to you as well. The, well, the changes that's happened to me in my life since I accepted Christ. So I just appreciate having the opportunity to come up here and, and share with you my testimony. I'm hoping to use this as a ministry. I've got many friends, former players, obviously going back. I got into coaching in the late 70s. I'm still in contact with many of these kids. And unfortunately, for uh, really my entire coaching career, I, I was a Christian by voice, but actually I had not, never really surrendered my life to Christ until after I got out of coaching. Uh, so hopefully this here will be something that I can use as a, as a tool to connect with a lot of these kids. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my wife because Susan uh, finished a battle with her cancer. She had invasive uh, ductal carcinoma, which was the most aggressive type of breast cancer there was. And uh, it was pretty, pretty far into it when we found out about it. And she just finished up her last treatment. It was a 13-month battle. Mm. And she came out victorious because I, I will guarantee you Christ was right there with us. And uh, I told her the day that we found out about it, we, we stopped, and, and obviously it was a gut punch. We stopped at a restaurant and went in to eat, and I told her I, I, had, I had the spirit of the Lord within me, and I, and I looked at her in the eye with a smile on my face, and I said, I know this seems bad now, but I said, we will come out the other side of this better than we went into it. Well, guess what? We have come out on the other side better than we went into it. And I give God the glory for that because he's, he's the king of all things good. And so our marriage is stronger. Uh, she was a wonderful person before cancer. She's a better person now. And she's getting better. She's feeling better every, every day. So I just wanted to get that, get that done first. Today as I was doing my readings, believe it or not, this popped up. And I just want to say Ephesians 5, 18, 19, it says, Be filled with the Spirit singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The first evidence that we're being filled with and led by the Holy Spirit is that we will have a song in our heart. Amen. And I want to say that tonight I have a melody in my heart and that that Holy Spirit has given me the life that I have today. So uh, I wanted to share that with you. Now, my education, like you said, I... I I graduated from Howard Payne University with a Bachelor's of Science. Uh, I attended college on a football scholarship. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I had a few accolades. I was a team captain four years. Uh, I ended up uh, signing a two-year contract with the Houston Oilers. I tore my ACL. Everything was looking good. It was a dream, of my, dream, dream that I would worked on my whole life. And it came to a crashing end. And, uh, but anyway, Life goes on from athletics. I got into coaching. I had many, many fine coaching brothers that guys that coach side by side. As you know, when you spend that much time with them, you become close. Mm -hmm. and many of these guys I still have relationships with today. Like Doug had said, many of these kids and I still communicate. Usually two to three on the average just uh, pop up from week to week and we kind of go on from there and reconnect. I have three daughters from my, my first marriage and they're adult children. And I just had my second granddaughter. You know, God has a sense of humor. I mean, think about this. I'm a 32 year football coach. Can you imagine how many football players I had for 32 years? And I've been blessed with three daughters and now two granddaughters and no boys of any kind. So I think God's going, you know what, Paul, you're getting what you deserve. And, uh, but I enjoy my girls. They are the blessing to me. And they will be my legacy. I tell them that all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're three very, very wonderful kids. And the greatest thing is, 
if they love their dad very, very much. I'm going to talk about my early childhood and how it, was, how it all got started, uh, my pathway my, 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 to where I got today. I was brought up in a Christian home. We were at church on Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings. We'd go on Wednesday nights. We, we participated in, in the church. Uh, I can remember going to the nativity scene as a small child. My dad was playing Joseph. You know, and it's freezing out there, and he was standing out there. I can remember just thinking, well, what a neat deal. My dad's getting to play Joseph. And, you know, my mother was always in the choir. Uh, so I grew up with a, with a very strong uh, Christian base. I had a Christian foundation. Around the fourth or fifth grade, I can't remember. My brother here tonight, he's 14 months older than me. Maybe he could remember, but I want to say I was either the fourth or fifth grade. He was the fifth or sixth grade. We went to our confirmation at the church. We got our Bibles with our names in it. We went up. We joined the church. Uh, we professed our Christian faith. And you know, to be quite honest, at that age, uh, I I really didn't accept Christ fully. I mean, I, I acknowledged. I had, like I said, I had the foundation. I, I knew knew everything I needed to know. But as you know, people come to Christ at their own time, and God plays a role in that. And as we do ourselves, we can never come to Christ until we fully commit ourselves. Uh, in my first marriage, I got married at, at the age of 20. My wife was 19. Uh, I turned 21 14 days later. That's a very young age. I was in college. Uh, she was a very wonderful person. Like I said, we had three daughters. And, uh, you know, we, we went to church. Uh, always, we've always gone to church. And my three daughters were raised in church. They were baptized in church. And the reason I'm saying this is because I just kind of want to give you a background of how a lot of people go through the same thing I think that I've gone through in my life where a lot of us are confused that going to church is going to get you to heaven. Going to church is the way, but it's much, much more than that, as you know, if you have a relationship with Christ. And, you know, I had a lot of success with my, with my teams. Uh, we did a lot of great things. I had a lot of success as a player, but truthfully, uh, even with that being said, being brought up in the church, uh, having loving and caring parents, and all the things that, that give you that foundation, uh, I still really never had a relationship with Christ, a personal relationship. There was a disconnect, uh, and really, I thought about it long and hard when I especially when I made this speech, I really kind of well, what you know what was the disconnect? The disconnect can only be me. Because when you when you have the foundation and you have the base and you, you have the opportunity and you hear the word, it almost as I went through my life, I prioritized my life and it, it, as a young adult, and I'm just gonna say that probably my children and my career were number one. I don't put one in front of the other. I would have to say my kids first and then my career. And I'm just being totally honest with you. My marriage would probably be number two behind that. Uh, then the third thing would be things that I enjoyed, things that gave me pleasure. Some of them weren't, some of them weren't good. Some of the things I like to spend my time with weren't the things that, that I should have been doing. They were, some of them were sinful. Some of them were just things that I took away from what I should have been doing. And then fourth was my, was my church, my faith. And obviously, to have a real relationship with Christ, He's got to be the center. Not only number one, He has to be the center of your life. He has to be the foundation of your life. And honestly, I did not have that. And therefore, like all of us, we come up with struggles in our life. We, we, we have things that are extremely difficult that we have to deal with. 
when things were going fine, you know, I was a fixer. I was a fixer in my house. I wanted to solve my kids' problems, my wife's problems. I was a fixer at work. I was an athletic director and a head coach. I tried to handle all those problems. But then there was always things that overloaded me. There was things that I could not fix. And unfortunately, when I would go to prayer, I really didn't, I really didn't know how to, to pray. I really didn't know how to reach out and really do that because I did not have a personal relationship with Christ. It was, it was a selfish relationship. My relationship with Christ, I would have to say, was a convenience at best. And so, therefore, uh, I suffered. I suffered with anxiety. I suffered with guilt. I su suffered with shame. Uh, and a lot of this was, was internal. I mean, you, I, may, I may have appeared strong and bold out in front of people, but inside, I had a tremendous amount of guilt. Because when your parents have done the job that my parents did with me, and by that time as an adult, I had, I had an older brother that was a fine Christian example. I saw how he lived his life, and, and I didn't live my life that way. So, uh, you know, when you give a testimony, you've got you to tell everybody where you started, and you've got to tell everybody what you went through. And you got to tell everybody about the journey. I retired at 52. I felt like my health was suffering. I didn't know exactly why. I'd gone through a really bad divorce. I don't know if there is a good divorce. I'd gone through a really tough situation. Uh, it was hard on my kids. It was hard on me. It was hard on my ex-wife. It was really hard on all my family and friends. But we went through it, and I found a wonderful woman, and we've got a great relationship. But shortly after that, I suffered my first heart attack at the age of 52. It kind of gave me a wake up. I think I became a much better person. I, I was in a committed relationship, monogamous. I was happier, and things, to be, things seemed to be going better, but I still did not have a full relationship with Christ like I should have had. Well, Unfortunately, or fortunately, as I heard today, sometimes God has things happen in your life for a reason, and sometimes it may even be something as tragic as something to do with your health. Uh, I got another wake-up call on May 2nd, 2012. It was my second heart attack. It was very severe. Uh, my wife and I had gone to the gym at 4.15 that morning. I was feeling good. Everything looked good. I felt like I was on my way to just strong and everything. And I started feeling bad on the way home. My wife uh, was getting ready for school. I said, I'm, I know something's wrong. I think it's my heart. I'm not going to say anything. She went in and started showering and cleaning up. And I said, I was going to get her off to school. And then I was going to drive in myself and see what was wrong. That's not very smart, number one. But. That's what I was going to do, but unfortunately it didn't work out that way. I ended up in the floor at the bottom of the stairs. I was calling her name out. Uh, the pain was so severe, I can't really describe it, but it was, uh, I was laying in a, in, a, in a pool of vomit, waiting for the, the ambulance to come, and it seemed like forever. And like I said, the pain was so severe, I was in and out of consciousness. It was still dark outside. They arrived. It was about seven, I think, in the morning by the time I got to the hospital. And as I was riding in the ambulance, uh, this was the moment for me. I, I want to explain to you how it feels to have a heart attack. If you've never had one, when you think I've already had one, I thought that would, a lot of people don't make it through a, a heart attack. Now I'm having number two, and. Um, the anxiety and the struggle, it would be like being nailed in a closet and there's a fire and the house is on fire and you know you're going to die. And you're trying to get out of the closet and you can't get out. And that's the best way to describe it. And I was, I was fighting, I was, I was struggling with what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, I began to pray. And... Uh, At that moment, I gave my life to Christ. And uh, 
it's it's hard to explain. Uh, I quit asking about me, and I start thinking about my family and my wife and my kids. And instead of struggling and panicking in that in that situation, I looked up to the paramedic and I said, "Am I going to make it?" And he looked at me in my eyes and said, "We're doing all we can." It was not a confidence builder. <laughs> and then I. I just basically said, God, you've given me five years since my first heart attack. What a, what a wonderful life I've had. What a wonderful life. Please, I surrender to you. I repent of my sins. Please forgive me. And if this is your will, you can have me. And honestly, a peace came over me like nothing I've ever felt in my life. And it could only be the Holy Spirit. In my, in, my, my, in my mind, that's the only thing that could have happened at that moment. And that's what I remember. And this was 7 in the morning, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that afternoon, as you're coming out of the anesthesia, right? You know, you hear sounds, you hear noises, and I could hear two of my three daughters who were in Bismarck, North Dakota, which is, if you drove would be 20 hours. If you flew and you had a ticket, it would still take three to four hours. They were, they had already arrived and they were there. And I could hear their voice and I was thinking, am I in heaven? <laughs> you're kind of coming out, you're, you're droggy. And I'm thinking, I could hear my kids. Then I heard my wife laughing. I could hear them, you know, having nothing. I'm alive. And I looked around the room and the doctors came in. They said, "We we, we got you. We got you saved for right now, but you've got another artery that's got a hundred percent blockage." I did not do the procedure because he said, "I've got a guy. It's just too hard for me." He said, "We're going to have to go back in the next day and give you another give you another work over." And this guy's much better, so I had to go under the next day. So that evening, I got my I got my phone, and you know. Here's the difference in saying you love Christ and saying you're Christian and actually being a Christian. You know, if you're faking it, it depends on the group of people you're with at the time. You know, if you're with Christian people, then you're a Christian. When you're with non-Christian people and you're not doing Christian things, then you don't speak of your faith. But from that moment, I tell everybody that sees me, if you see me at McDonald's, that's how I met Doug. If you see me at Walmart and I run into you, I'm going to share my life with Christ. I'm going to reach out to you. And they did the procedure. I came out with 10 stents. I've got about 25% ejection fraction, which I go every three months to my cardiologist and I can barely... I, I see people that can barely make it across the room. They're on walkers, they're on canes. And they've got better ejection fraction than I do. Okay? I've hauled hay. My wife has got to vouch for this. She can tell you the truth. I've hauled hay, which I'm not supposed to do. I go to the gym every day, which I am supposed to do. But I've done a lot of physical work over the last six years that I really shouldn't have been doing. And yet I've done it with less ejection fraction, less heart function than many people I see every day. I don't have the answer for that. But the only thing I can tell you is I think God has His hands on me. God has His hands on me. And because of that, I'm going to take every opportunity of every day to spread the Word. So really, at 55 years old, when I'm 62 now, was when I really surrendered. And I, I know no other word to use as surrender. Because at some point, if you're going to accept Christ, it's not a part-time job. It's not something you do, it's at your convenience. It's not something you do in times of need. It's not something you do when things are going good. It's something that you live every day, day in and day out. I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I thank the Lord for what He's given me. It's like, a, it's like being on a cell phone, you make the call, thank you God, and I don't, I don't turn the cell phone off all day. 
I stay in touch with him. I leave it on, and I talk to him when I go to bed at night, and I, and I thank him again. And I think that in itself is the way I want to live my life. Whatever days I have left, I want to share my experience with as many people as I can, and I would like to be a part of bringing as many people to Christ as I can and give my testimony. The Holy Spirit guides me now. And it came through tough times and a lot of came through a lot of hardship to get there. But I'm certainly thankful that I am where I am today. I don't I have not felt sorry for myself one day in this last ten years with my disease, my heart disease. Because I know at any moment, any moment, I could be gone. I could be around for 20 more years. I could be around for 20 more minutes. The time I have left, I want to do it praising and giving God the glory for all things good. I will tell you this, it's the best decision that Paul Talbert has ever made, without a doubt. There's nothing I could have ever done. And my children know, my wife knows, my mother knows, my brothers know that there's nothing that will ever come between me and my relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when that relationship is strong, I know that all the other parts of my life are going to be strong. And that's what's so ironic about this whole thing is so many people, and I hope people are hearing me, I'm glad I'm being video, because there's so many people out there that, that don't understand. They think they can do this all by themselves. But Jesus is the only way. The only way to get there. And also, uh, you know, God has a plan. He has a plan for all of us. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want to give you that opportunity tonight. I want you to realize that, that John 3.16 says, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believes in Him should have eternal life. And later in John, on John 10, He says, I come to give, your life, give you life more abundantly, more completely and with a purpose. And that's, that's, that's probably the verse in a nutshell that, that tells you what Christianity is about. That He came to give life in death he died for us. Man has to overcome sin. And the Bible calls sin in Romans 3.23, he says that all, all of us are sinners and we will all fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. We're all, we're all sinners. And we have to confess that sin. We not only have to believe that Jesus Christ came and died for us, that He arose three days later, and He's ascended into heaven, He's going to come again in His glory, and He's going to come and claim His people. He's going to, he's going to take us back. So if you sin, you need to confess your sin. You need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness. And then the third thing you need to do is realize again that God sent His own Son to die for our sins, and this is how, when we accept this, we, we develop a relationship with Jesus Christ forever. He died and was buried on the third day. He arose again according to the Scripture. You must believe that to receive Christ. We also need to understand that 100% of us will die. The human race is more. I can guarantee you that 100% of us will die because there's no other way out. The only thing that you can ask for is to ask for Jesus Christ to come into your life and He's the only way. That he's the truth and the light and He will take you to, the, take you to eternal life. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. That's probably my favorite verse. And because of the guilt that I really never understood what grace meant. 
now I understand what grace means. It's, it's an amazing thing. I'm not worthy. None of us truthfully are worthy of His grace. None of us are truly worthy of His forgiveness. But He gives it to us anyway. And all we have to do is believe. And all we have to do is accept it. Believe me, when you do those things and you repent and you believe and you ask God to come into your life, that's all you need to do. And you can be an eternal. You can have the best. I've, I've got a good insurance plan here on earth, but the, I've got a benefit plan that, that's better than anything, and it's called eternal life. And it's going to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to see all those people that I've loved, and, and it's going to be just a, a marvelous, marvelous thing. Uh, I like to pray this prayer with you now. I would like that each of us pray together, and and it goes like this: I want you to guide my life, Lord, I want you to guide my life, Lord, and to help me do Your will in the name of Jesus. Help me do Your will in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer and you believe in Christ and you put Him in the center point of your life, then you are now Christian and you are now saved. And if anybody here feels like that they've been moved by this and they want to profess their faith, there'll be people here after the service or after we get through here with this testimony that will be praying with you and we'll make sure that, that uh, you're headed in the right direction. But again, in closing, uh, being good isn't good enough. There's people that are bad and they're still going to get saved. There's people that are good and do good things and they're not going to be saved. It's, it's the most personal commitment and the most personal decision that you can ever make in your life. It's number one. Put Jesus Christ first in your life. Thank you very much. Being transparent. Susan, you have a winner. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd like to uh, open it up if you have any prayer need. We'd love to pray for you. If you have an infirmity, um, if you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, or anything.